Uh, again, my great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I'm a relatively new faculty member at Babson, just a couple of years, but I've known about the institution and incredibly proud of uh, what the institution stands for, because I think entrepreneurship and business really are things that we need to celebrate and spread around the world. And that's really what we're trying to do with the, uh, the idea of conscious capitalism. So what I'm going to uh, share with you in the next 45 minutes or so is an overview of this idea of conscious capitalism, how it came about, why we believe it's essential, and how it works, and some steps uh, going forward. I'd like to start with this uh, simple metaphor. Remember the first time in a garden you see a caterpillar when you were a child, perhaps, and then you see a butterfly flying around, and somebody tells you it's the same creature, the caterpillar and the butterfly? Well, it seems pretty magical, right? Like, how can that be the same creature? They don't look anything alike. They don't act anything alike. And yet it is the same exact DNA. But the big difference, of course, the caterpillar exists at a certain level of consciousness, which is all about consumption. Right? All the caterpillar essentially does is eat. And then at a certain point, nature steps in and switches on what are called imaginal cells. And the caterpillar then goes through this metamorphosis and emerges as this other creature, a creature of light and beauty, but also a creature that uh, performs a uh, very important function in nature, which is that of pollination. So it goes from being a consumer to a pollinator. In other words, it's creating flourishing all around it, not just for itself, but for all other species. And that's really the kind of journey, I think, that we can be on as human beings. And I think most of us do evolve. When we are born, we are kind of caterpillar-like. But then we do evolve and grow over time. And our journey has no limits. We can rise to extraordinary levels of consciousness and impact in the world. And the same is true of these entities that we create, organizations, corporations, that we can relegate them to operate at that caterpillar level, which is to say they're just about taking in you know, natural resources, financial resources, human resources, as we call them, and simply generating profit for themselves, as opposed to thinking about what is their role in the flourishing of the whole. And that's really the journey, I think, of a conscious organization to recognize the impact that we have on the lives of everybody that we touch. Now, the difference, of course, is that for human beings, this has to be a choice. Right? The caterpillar doesn't wake up one day and say, what kind of a life am I living? You know, there's no meaning in my life, right? It automatically, nature makes it into a butterfly. But for us as human beings, as Peter Kastenbaum has said, we have reached such explosive levels of freedom that we are in charge of our own mutation. We have to decide that we're going to evolve and grow, operate at a different level. This is really something that is a conscious choice uh, that, that uh, human beings need to make. Now, before I talk about conscious capitalism, I do want to talk a little bit about capitalism. Because this is an institution that is not really well understood and, of course, has many, many critics around the world. There are many countries in the world where you could get into a fight by calling somebody a capitalist. It's almost seen as a bad word, right? And I want to really talk about what it really is, which is freedom. It's around free markets and free people, basically. Human beings are being allowed to do what comes naturally to human beings. And if you look at the history of the last 2,000 years in economic terms, largely, which is shown here, that we have some interesting data on per capita incomes that have been estimated in today's dollars going back about 2,000 years. And what we find is startling because you see that per capita incomes for most of that time have ranged in the four to $600 range, basically. Right? So mostly less than $500 per person per year which means that 90% of humanity survived on less than $1 a day, which today is below the level of extreme poverty, which is $1.25. So that was the default condition of human beings. Today, it's a minority of people who are in that state. Right? And so that was what the average person dealt with. And if you looked at what uh, we did in the last uh, millennium, you know, the human uh, society started to come out of cages, and we had significant breakthroughs that happened in terms of the uh, Renaissance starting in Italy, and then, of course, we had the Gutenberg invention of the printing press. So more people had access to knowledge through books, but the fact is that 90% of people were illiterate, so that really didn't help them at all. So all of these breakthroughs that were happening, the age of reason and enlightenment, Isaac Newton and Galileo discovering the laws of the universe and our, our place in the universe, 
All of that were significant breakthroughs for our species, but really weren't impacting our people at all. It went on pretty much in the same way. So what did start to change was in the 18th century, finally, we had significant breakthroughs. We had the Industrial Revolution occurring around the year 1750 in Scotland. Right? And for the first time now, we were able to produce goods, manufactured products in far more efficient ways. And those countries that had access to these new technologies were significantly benefited by that. And you see a lot of prosperity from that. But even more significant, perhaps, a quarter century later, also in Scotland. It's interesting, Scotland turns out to play a key role. I thought it was all about Scotch whiskey and golf from Scotland, right? Also brought us the Industrial Revolution and Adam Smith, who wrote a book called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, where he asked the question, why is it that some places, some societies are more prosperous than others? And he found that it wasn't about natural resources and it wasn't about the work ethic, it really had to do with the sort of freedom that prevailed. If people were allowed to make decisions for themselves about what to focus on and then also allowed to trade with each other, as opposed to a government or some bureaucrat deciding what should be produced, how much should be produced, what should be the price, centralized planning doesn't work. The invisible hand of the market, as he called it, really is the most powerful allocator of efforts and resources. And that will then generally meet the needs of most people and that those societies will prosper, but it's rooted in the idea of freedom. And the interesting historical coincidence in a way is that that is the exact same year, 1776, that the United States was born as an idea. It's the only country that I know of that was actually created on the basis of a set of ideas that all revolve around freedom. It was about religious freedom, it was about political freedom. Sorry. Oh, really? Okay, but there's no mic here. Oh. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, the United States thing was born in 1776. Idea, now no, no other country came into being because of a set of beliefs, and the beliefs are all around freedom. So the Declaration of Independence really is a very significant document, I think, in the history of the world, not just of the United States, because it really enshrines some of the highest human aspirations towards freedom. And even though the United States obviously did not live up to all of those ideals, initially, and it took a long time really, I mean the journey is still ongoing to live up to the language that's in that document, but that idea was extremely powerful and certainly was embodied to an extent. And if you see the combination of these factors coming together, you can see that humanity has been on a, an almost vertical trajectory in the last 200 years the combination of the technological breakthrough, the intellectual breakthrough, and then this, this oxygen of freedom that was made available. Per capita incomes have risen roughly 15-fold, uh, almost 20-fold in that time. Countries like the United States are about 100 times better off in terms of average person standard of living. Life expectancy has gone from 28 or 30 years, which it was for most of history, to over 70 years now. Literacy has gone from 10% to 90% on a worldwide basis. So almost every indicator of human development, human progress has risen dramatically, coincident with this rise of freedom, free markets and free people, which we call capitalism. So there's a lot of gloom and doom out there. And I think Bill Clinton put it well. He said, don't mistake the trend lines for the headlines. In other words, the headlines are always about what's bad and what's not working. The fact is we are making progress. Human beings are on a journey, and we're making extremely rapid progress in many ways. And we are learning and evolving as we, as we go. And one of those misconceptions is around the idea of the impact that capitalism has on poverty. And the, the reality is that capitalism is the entity that is ending extreme poverty on this planet, or all kinds of poverty, really. The percentage of people living on less than $1.25 a day, which is now the standard for extreme poverty, is uh, down to about in the, in the teens, 13, 14%, down from about 90% 200 years ago. And if you look at the current trend lines, the projections are that we can eliminate or eradicate extreme poverty in the next 20, 30 years. This is part of the UN Millennial Goals, and we're actually ahead of target on that. The real issue there is not the unequal distribution of income, it's the unequal distribution of freedom, and to the extent that we can spread freedom around the world, 
and bring the power of these ideas and, and the freedom uh, to more people, we will spread prosperity. And I'm really sure that Babson plays a key role through Babson Global in, in spreading those kinds of ideas and creating those kinds of systems uh, in many places around the world. Now, so we start with some beliefs about what business is about. The, what is the narrative about business that, what is the story about business that we tell ourselves, that we tell our children, that we, you know, the media propagates, that's in the movies, etc. that business is thought about as being all about what? Selfishness, greed, and exploitation. That's the popular perception about business. Have you ever seen a movie in which the hero is a business leader? I don't know if it happens here. It certainly doesn't happen in the U.S., which is the home of business, right? I mean, the home of capitalism. Business people are almost inevitably portrayed in a negative light because we have created this idea that it's about selfishness, exploitation, and greed. And people took Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market and self-interest and made that into selfishness and said selfishness is okay because the invisible hand, selfishness can never be okay. It's not a virtue. Greed is not a virtue. And no business person ever needs to actually say that because it isn't true. Well, the real story of business is that it's fundamentally good because it's rooted in the idea of creating value. If you don't create value for customers, for employees, for community suppliers, ultimately you do not survive. Business is also based on this idea of voluntary exchange. Businesses cannot coerce anybody to buy from them, to supply to them, to work for them, etc. They can only offer value. And if you offer value that the other person is willing to trade for, then they will engage in that. So both sides have to be better off. The only institution in society that has coercive power is the government. And governments can put you in jail or put you to death if you do things that they don't agree with. But businesses don't have that power. It's only based on voluntary exchange and therefore fundamentally ethical. But more than that, we would say business is noble because it elevates human existence. It allows us to live more fully human lives. Think about those people living thousands of years on this planet, human beings like you and I, but surviving, you know, basically struggling just to stay alive, right? working every waking hour of the day just to see another day. How many of them could actually explore what it means to be born a human being, born with extraordinary, almost divine capacities as human beings? There's an expression that this planet used to be molten lava, and today it sings opera. Where does that come from? The human capacity for art and literature and music and abstract thinking, extraordinary things that we can do, can only happen if people are given a certain level of prosperity and a certain level of resources. And business really has enabled that. And finally, business is the institution that lifts people out of poverty. Governments cannot lift people out of poverty. And nonprofits and churches can help, but they cannot sustainably lift people out. It ultimately has to be business and entrepreneurship that creates that. And therefore, we believe it's heroic. That's the subtitle of our book, is Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business. These are the heroes that we really should be celebrating in the world. Now, despite all of that progress and good news, the fact is that we are living at a time when the level of trust that people have, or confidence in big business, big business especially, has really plummeted. So if you look at the last 40 years or so, and this is in the US, you know, it's worse in some other places. The level of confidence has gone down from about 35 down to as low as 16% in 2009 during the last economic downturn, which was below the U.S. Congress, by the way, that year. It's never happened before. The big business is trusted less than, uh, than the Congress. And the fact is that this level of mistrust and cynicism has significant consequences because when people are operating in that mode, they cannot be innovative, they cannot be creative. You don't get the kind of breakthrough thinking that we're going to need as a collective species if we're going to continue to make progress, if we're going to bring modernity and prosperity to the billions of people who still don't have it, and if you're going to continue to the standards of living that many have become accustomed to, we cannot do that in the same way. We will have to invent new ways of doing almost everything. And that won't happen when most people are cynical and disengaged and distrustful. So this is a crisis. We don't realize it, but this really is a crisis. We have to do something. Business is the essential institution in society, but it is deeply, deeply flawed at this moment in terms of how it operates. So the question is, how did we get here? What caused these problems that we are facing today? So I want to do a very quick sort of historical perspective on that, that a number of things have changed within the lifetimes of just about everybody in this room. There have been what I would call tectonic shifts in the last 25 years or so. The world has significantly changed. 
in dramatic ways, and we human beings have changed, and we're continuing to evolve and change at a very rapid rate. We don't even realize it because we're in the middle of all that change. But if you step back and look at some of the things that I will talk about, you'll see how much has changed. And the fact is that corporations and societal institutions generally haven't adapted to these new realities. Change is happening much too fast. Right? And we're still using an operating system that was created in the industrial age, rooted in the military as the organizing metaphor. And that simply is not the world in which most people live today. I'd like to take you back to another year. I mentioned 1776, but an equally significant year, I would say, is 1989. Anybody remember what happened? What's the big news of 1989? We all lived through the 25th anniversary of many of these things I'm going to talk about recently. Remember the collapse or the fall of the Berlin Wall? The bringing down of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989, a significant event in our history, right? Remember, before that, we were living with this competing ideologies, the defining debate of the 20th century between these alternative ways of organizing human society, freedom, democracy, capitalism, versus socialism, and ownership and control of every aspect of your life. And these were choices, and you have kind of had to line up one or the other. And suddenly that debate was over, without a gunshot being fired. And we have the birth of many new liberal democracies around the world, and, and uh, the recognition that this is the best system that we have come up with so far for how human society should organize. That was preceded a few months earlier by the events in Tiananmen Square, if you remember that scene in China. Very significant, June 1st of 1989. Couldn't imagine that people in China would you know, those young kids would rise up and ask for freedom. Of course, that was crushed brutally a few days ago. Plan some things and inspire people around the world. That was also the year we had an oil spill in Alaska, the Exxon Valdez, which, you know, there had been many oil spills, but this one really impacted people in a significant way. This caught people's imagination. This made people conscious about the environment in a whole different way. And people started volunteering and flying up to Alaska and doing what they could to help. So you could say that the mass consciousness around the environment also happened around 1989. And it was also the year when we had the re-emergence of religious feminism as a force on this planet. You know, we had had a pretty secular century or so before that. You know, we used to have religious wars historically, but now suddenly this was the fatwa issued by the Irish an author. Now you had religious fundamentalism and other forms of religious fundamentalism also now in reaction to that around the world. Like in India, for example, there's the Hindu fundamentalism is a growing issue. What else happened in 1989? There was a very important, uh, but at the time really not uh, noticed, demographic shift that happened. We reached a tipping point in the U.S. where we had more adults over the age of 40 than below. So we reached this, 40 is really midlife. That's the beginning of midlife. And you've all heard of the midlife crisis, right? I mean, people joke about it. But there's something real about that. There is a crisis of meaning that happens where people start to realize that the standards by which they have lived, the values that they have lived by, the goals that they had set for themselves, that somehow they weren't as meaningful. Having achieved a lot of that material success, they still feel empty. And they say, is that all there is in life? What is the purpose of my life? What is it that I'm going to leave behind? What is my legacy going to be? People start volunteering for causes. They start supporting various kinds of uh, you know, initiatives around the world, setting up their own foundation. It's a very dramatic change, actually, that happens. And if you think about the impact on the young people as well, you know, the millennial generation, the kids who are now coming into college, grew up with parents who were going through this transition. And that generation, Millennials is known as the most meaning and purpose-driven generation the world has ever seen. They are at an early age thinking about life in a different way and their work in a different way. What kind of an impact? All these young entrepreneurs who are starting businesses, it's not just about making money, it's really about making a difference right? and solving real issues that are out there. Now, this is a worldwide phenomenon. The median age of adults in the U.S. now is 44. It's well into the high 40s in uh, Europe. It's well into the 50s in Japan. And I'm sure it's pretty high in Latin America and other China. India, the birth rate used to be 6.5 when I was growing up, and now it's 2.5. So the reason this happens, life expectancy increasing and birth rate going down. And that's true now. The birth rate is below replacement in 100 countries around the world. So the aging of the population is going to be a significant thing, which means more and more people will be driven by meaning and purpose 
whether they are customers, employees, citizens around the world. 1989 was also the year that we had this guy invent a technology that changed the lives of everybody in this room and almost everybody on this planet, more so than any other single person has done. And most people don't even recognize who he is. So his name is Tim Berners-Lee, and he invented the World Wide Web in 1989. Is that a big deal? You think it has changed our lives? Yeah. Is it fair to say that the average person today has access to more information instantaneously at their fingertips, anytime, any place, for free, than the richest person in the world did 20 years ago? That's not an exaggeration. As they in Washington, that is a true fact. Okay? It's not just any fact. It is really significant has ever existed. You know, I was asking a question the other day, and my daughter, of course, looked it up within seconds. Looks like we're doing a switch on the microphone. Is that for me or for the audience? Okay. So I asked a question. She got me an answer within microseconds, right? And then she says to me, Dad, what did you guys do in the old days? <laughs> I say, it wasn't so long ago, you know, but I, I don't know what we did. What did we do? I don't know. We, we tossed and turned, and maybe we asked somebody, or we just... We lived in blissful ignorance. But today, there's no question you can ask that you can't get an answer. And that's simply extraordinary. So we're amazingly well informed today, which means everything in the world is transparent. Anything happening in a government, in a business, anybody can know about. The other big thing that's happened is that we are amazingly more in, uh, connected. Another true fact, in 1995, half the people on this planet had not made or received one single phone call in their lifetime. Let me repeat that, one single phone call. Half the people on this planet had not been touched by telecommunications. In India, there was one phone for 100 people. And today, there are more phones than there are people in the world. Homeless people in India can access this technology now. We are, we are connected together there. You know, uh, social media, of course, is exploding. Humanity is connected together almost like with a shared central nervous system. Anything happening anywhere can be known to anybody, and we can act upon it. Yeah, so we have meetups and flash mobs and Arab Springs and all these things that erupt out of nowhere, but there's an extraordinary infrastructure, nothing like which had, has ever existed before. We are also becoming more intelligent. Now, this is not as well known a phenomenon, but something called the Flynn effect, where Flynn went back and looked at the IQ testing data for the last 80 or so years where the data was available. And normally it gets, it's, it gets normalized to 100 every 10 years. So the 100 is always the average IQ. But he found that if you, if you just look at the underlying raw data, that human IQ has been rising at 3 to 4% every 10 years for the last 80 years or so. And if you do the compounding on that, what it means is that the average person today would be in the top 2% of intelligence 80 years ago. They would be smarter than 98% of the people. And today is just an average person. So we are, I mean, this is unprecedented. We're not supposed to evolve this quickly, but we are. And the explanations for that are many, but the point is people are smart. You cannot fool them. We used to say that you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time. I'm sorry, today you cannot fool anybody any of the time. If your business or government, anybody relies on fooling people, not going to work. Maybe they'll get fooled for five minutes, and then somebody's going to give them the correct information, and then they'll be mad, and then they'll blog. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's going to come back. So this level of intelligence out there is extraordinary. Right? And you see it, the impacts of that now. Hundreds of millions of people around the world are capable of extraordinary things. We never had that situation before. Now, it's one thing to be intelligent, but if you don't have access to higher education, again, this is where universities come in, a lot of that potential remains locked up. If you saw that movie, Goodwill Hunting, where the janitor was smarter than the MIT professors. But if you didn't have access to be able to go to university and unlock that knowledge or the potential, you know, it would remain bottled up. Now, 100 years ago, only 9% of Americans finished high school. And today, 90% do. And of those who finished high school, a small fraction, maybe 20%, went to college. Today, well over 45% go to college. And worldwide, this is an exploding phenomenon. South Korea is about 75 to 80% now going to college. And now with the internet, we have access to all these online courses, et cetera. Access to cutting edge higher knowledge is going to be available almost universally around the world. And the impact of this has been greatest on women. Higher education is 
finally the great equalizer between men and women. That is enabling women to finally step forward and realize their potential. In the US, remember 1989, that was the year also when more women had college degrees in the US than men, cumulatively. And now 60% of college students in the US are women, and they get significantly higher grades, which means that every white collar profession will be statistically dominated by women in years to come. Medical profession, legal profession, education, even business and entrepreneurship, the trends are very much in that direction. And this will fundamentally alter the complexion of society because for millennia, every societal institution has been run by men based on masculine values alone. All of us have access to so-called masculine and feminine values. Domination, aggression, competition, winning, results, etc., etc. Nurturing, caring, compassion, relationships, all of those kinds of things. But men have tended to emphasize one side and they have really pretty much ruled every aspect of society. And now we're starting to see the rise of feminine values in a significant way in men and women. So the women who are showing up as leaders now are not trying to be men in women's clothing. We used to have Margaret Thatcher who was the Iron Lady and Indira Gandhi in India. Right? She was known as the only man in her cabinet. In fact, she was the only woman in her cabinet, but she was tougher than the toughest men. Golda Meir in Israel was also known as an iron lady. So only iron ladies could really make it in that world. And today, women can show up really as full human beings, tapping into all of the qualities that they possess that come naturally. And men too, men leaders, were going to have to integrate this side, the feminine values, which are essential human values, that are nurturing, caring, compassion. Those are the highest human values. And so the ideal that we're moving towards is really beautifully depicted in the Indian tradition as what's called the Ardhanareshwari. This is kind of half man, half woman. This is a god who on the one side is Shiva, the other side is Shakti. It really blends both. It's not about one or the other. You know, we've had 6,000 patriarchy, which was preceded by matriarchy. We don't, need, we don't need either. We need a humanarchy. We need a combination of essential human values. And the last element here is that of consciousness, right? What do we mean by this word conscious? Simply, at one level, it means that we are waking up, we are becoming more mindful, seeing reality as it truly exists. For a long time on this planet, we lived with blinders on. All we could think about was the next day and our own survival. We didn't have the luxury of thinking about the long term or the impact on others, but now we're taking off those blinders and we're zooming out and we're seeing a bigger and bigger picture and we're seeing the consequences of our actions not only in front of us, but somewhere else. And once we start to see those consequences, we then take more responsibility for them. And we have a better sense of right and wrong. Remember, 150 years ago, there was slavery, in, not only in the US, but in many countries. And the US fought a bloody civil war to end it. But if you go back in human history, every civilization has had slavery. And it was seen as an acceptable, normal thing. And today, we cannot imagine that. 100 years ago, no women on this planet had the right to vote, except for New Zealand and one other island. In the US, it was 1920 that women got the, think about how extraordinary that is. The US democracy is really less than 100 years old, if you really think about it that way. Half the population was excluded. Switzerland, women didn't get the right to vote until 1970. And I was there a couple of years ago, and they said, we just had an election, and now there are more women in the government than there are men. Women are running the country, and 40 years ago, they couldn't vote in that country. That's how rapidly we are evolving. 75 years ago, we still had colonialism. India was a British colony. It's another form of slavery. 50 years ago, we had segregation in many parts of the US. 30 years ago, animal abuse and, and child labor and environmental degradation, all of those were legally acceptable. And 20 years ago, we still had apartheid in South Africa. And 10 years ago, there was no gay marriage anywhere in the US. Massachusetts was the first state to allow it. Now there are 35 states within 10 years. Think about how extraordinary that rate of progress is. And this is not a journey that will ever end. Our consciousness is going to continue to evolve and, and rise. And things that we are doing today, we will look back on and say, how did we tolerate the United States having the highest percentage of its population in prison of any human society? Right? I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's, that is something that will change and has to change. The way animals are treated in the farm system, factory farming, you know, these are all indicators or, or, or examples of things that might evolve and change. We are also becoming more inclusive, recognizing the power of diversity 
of all kinds, not just gender or race, but age and, you know, and, and many other factors. And we're learning to live in harmony with nature. We're not just trying to conquer nature and bend nature to our will, but actually learning to live in a way that sustains and, and grows with nature. So that's a lot of changes I've talked about in the last 15 minutes or so. How am I doing on time? Very good, OK. Um, as Lincoln said, in a very different context, but he said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. And today, that is even more true than it was in his time. Almost everything has changed. As Tom Stoppard said in his play Arcadia to one of his characters, a door like this has cracked open only three or four times since we got up on our two legs. It's the best possible time to be alive and almost everything you thought you knew is wrong. You need to rethink everything. All assumptions, all mental models have to be reconsidered because the world is fundamentally different, people are fundamentally different, our challenges are different, our requirements are different. And what does this mean? It, it has consequences for every societal institution but certainly in the world of business, it has significant consequences. So the question we ask is, what will it take for companies to truly flourish, not just succeed, narrowly defined, but truly flourish in the world in the future? How will they have to change what they do? So essentially, they have to align with all of these forces. They have to reflect the higher consciousness that people have. They have to give people a sense of meaning and purpose. Right? They have to recognize what is right and what is wrong. And an example of that that I'll use is uh, Whole Foods, a company that I've come to know pretty well now. I wrote the book, Conscious Capitalism, the founder and CEO of this company. It's about a $14 billion company now, 85,000 employees, a pioneer in the natural organic foods movement worldwide, and really has had a transformative impact on the culture in terms of how people, their relationship they have with food. So Whole Foods was founded on this higher purpose. The original name of Whole Foods in 1978 was Safer Way. Because there's a chain in the US called Safeway and this little company in Austin was saying, no, there's a safer way, which is you don't need all these artificial ingredients and colors and antibiotics. You know, that you can eat food that is going to be better for your body and better for the food system and better for the planet. So that's their whole purpose, is educating people and giving them access to that kind of food. And that remains as relevant today as it was when they started, even more so, actually. Because if you look at the data, in 1960, the U.S. spent about 16% of GDP on food and only about 5 6% on healthcare. Today, US is up to 20% of GDP on healthcare, and only about 8% on food. Think about that. Right? We are ingesting extraordinary amounts of calories, but we are paying for it dramatically in terms of health consequences. Right? So that need remains as significant as ever. The second thing you will see on their website is this document called the Declaration of Interdependence, recognizing that all of the stakeholders of this business, customers, employees, suppliers, communities, farmers, investors, etc., all exist in an interconnected and interdependent web. That the well-being of each is connected to the well-being of the other. And therefore, the company needs to be run in a way that reflects that, which is to say, Every decision should simultaneously benefit all the stakeholders, or at least should not harm any one stakeholder if you're benefiting another. Right? So recognizing that interdependence says that all of them matter, all of them are ends in themselves. The well-being of customers, the well-being of employees is inherently important. It's not just about the well-being of investors. It's not just about the purpose of business is not just to make money. There has to be a purpose that goes beyond that, right? And therefore, the well-being of all stakeholders is inherently a part of that. They have some of the factors that you can see here, the high degree of transparency, modestly paid executives. People at the front lines are paid much better and they get higher, uh, better benefits, but this, the executives, the CEO and others, the, there's a cap of 19 to 1. Now the typical public company in the US is about 380 to 1. And it's been as high as right? So that ratio tells you something because if you use money as the only way to attract a leader, then you get a leader who only cares. About you. But leaders really need to more than just money. They need to care about the purpose. They need to care about the people, right? And the planet and the long-term consequences. I'll come back to that a little bit more. And these companies spend very little on marketing. They don't need to, you know, this is how I discovered this way of being. I was a marketing professor. I had done a lot of research showing that companies spend huge amounts of money on marketing and yet have very low customer loyalty and trust in the U.S. One trillion dollars a year in 2007 spent on ads and coupons and things like that. And yet customer loyalty and trust were like, 10, 15 percent. And the more spending had gone up, the more those numbers had declined. 
So we look for companies that actually spend very little and yet have very high customer loyalty and trust. And Whole Foods and all these companies were examples of that. You don't need to spend a lot of money on coupons and ads and sales if you've got a value proposition that people love and customers truly feel the benefits from that. You get the benefit of free marketing, right? which is word of mouth. And Whole Foods has been an extraordinary investment over the years. So none of this is about saying that making profits or returns is bad. No, making profits is a good thing. The question is, how do you do it? So these uh, examples that I talked about illustrate the four basic pillars or tenets of conscious capitalism. First of all, the idea of a higher purpose beyond profit. The purpose of business is not to maximize profits. Profits are essential and necessary, but there needs to be, just like for us as human beings, we need red blood cells in order to live. It doesn't mean that I should dedicate my life to producing as many red blood cells as possible. I should define a purpose for my life, and then I use my health and vitality to help me fulfill that. Businesses should define a purpose, and then, of course, profits are an engine that enable them to grow and have a greater impact on the purpose that they have defined for themselves. Integrating the interests of all stakeholders, treating them all as ends in themselves, not just as a means to the end of making money. Conscious leadership, which is about mentoring, motivating, and developing, and inspiring, and serving, and it's not about command and control, and it's not about carrots and sticks. And a culture that is built upon trust, and transparency, and respect, and caring, and it's not about fear and stress. So again, you answer the question, why, and what do we do, and who does it, and, and how do we do things? All of those things change when you have a conscious business. And for each of these, I have an acronym that, uh, that I will share, which actually captures the essence of what, what, uh, what is different about how we think about that. So let me quickly talk a little bit about purpose. You know, I believe that every great purpose, or every purpose of a great company, needs to be in some way a healing purpose. It needs to enable people to get well, to get better. Because we have a world in which there's a tremendous amount of suffering in health. And every business needs to be part of alleviating that. So we need to think, so the word healing really refers to that, but it also then refers to the attributes the great purposes have, which are listed here, and I'm not gonna uh, go into each of them. But essentially, most great purposes have left some aspect of each of these dimensions to them. So for example, Southwest Airlines was created with the idea of bringing freedom to the skies. 85% of Americans had never flown in an airplane when Southwest Airlines started in the late 60s. And today, 90% fly routinely. Why? Because Southwest Airlines made it affordable, made it accessible, and made it fun. So that fundamentally has been their, their stock market symbol, by the way, is love, L-U-V. Why? Because they say we just love everybody. We love our customers, we love our suppliers, we love our employees, of course, right? REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, which purpose they define as reconnecting people with nature. You know, we are becoming quite disconnected in, with nature in many countries, especially now with all the electronics. The CEO, Sally Jewell, was at one of our conferences. She is now the Interior Secretary of the United States. But she had tears in her eyes when she was saying that our children are spending 54 hours a week in front of a screen of some kind, but only 20 minutes of unstructured time in nature. So we are becoming completely disconnected from nature. We are part of nature, and yet we are losing that connection, and, and that has to have an impact on our well-being. So their whole passion and their purpose is, how do we get you reconnected? How do we help you learn how to be able to go camping and set up a tent and fish, you know, all the things. We will teach you, we will equip you. Now, the purpose can be thought about in two ways. One is, of course, the product. What is it that you're selling? How is it going to impact the lives of your customers? But there's also another purpose, which is a little more universal. You know, I just finished a book with a CEO who uh, the company produces capital goods machinery that is used to make toilet paper or cardboard boxes. And he said, we don't have a noble product. You know, we've got products that are pretty mundane. So I can't get people excited about coming to work and making another machine that makes more toilet paper. But he said, we have defined our purpose as our people. We measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. We are good stewards of their lives. We help them go home healthy, safe, and fulfilled so they can be good stewards of their families and their communities. And that's our purpose, and that is a pretty noble purpose. And every business in the world can relate to that, even if we don't have, as I said, a noble product-related purpose. So these are sort of the twin engines. Ideally, you want both. 
You can only have one. The people ultimately have to come first in any thinking. The second uh, pillar is stakeholders, and for that, the acronym that I use is SPICE, or actually SPICE. The reason I say I'm from India, and everything in India has spice. Okay, there's nothing that doesn't have spice, whether it's your laundry detergent, right, or any kind of food, or anything at all. It will always have spice, but what is life without spice? But it really stands for the stakeholders in the right order. I think society has to come first. Right? Society, partners, investors, customers, employees, environment. You have to be on the right side of society. Our business has to be part of the solution, part of the problem. We cannot be creating burdens for future generations to deal with. We have to be healing the world while we are also generating all the other benefits that we generate through a business. And in each of these you can see that there is a significant challenge and a significant opportunity. Marketing, for example, customers are called consumers. That their job is to consume. My job as a marketer is to try to get them to consume as much as possible. Now, there's a human being in that hamburger. Do you see him? We should think about them not as consumers, but as human beings whose quality of life we can impact, who we can help to lead better, healthier lives, right? By educating them, by leading them in the right direction, as opposed to simply catering to their desires and wants and addictions. Creating and feeding addictions is not a good purpose to have as a business, as opposed to saying, healing and restoring people to wellness. This is the way Whole Foods depicts their stakeholder system. Now, if you do it in the right way, this becomes a virtuous cycle, right? So if you start with a set of uh, mission and values, purpose and values, and then you attract people to come and work because they too are foodies and they're passionate about health, right? And they're going to be completely engaged and committed and motivated when they are there and they will educate your customers and treat them extremely well. And customers are going to keep coming back, and you treat your suppliers also as partners and as employees, right? not as, as combatants or adversaries. And that's going to ultimately lead to great returns and great sales and motivated investors, and it's going, then going to allow you to, of course, invest in community, invest in the environment, all of those kinds of things. This is a virtuous cycle that just keeps building on itself. Now, this is a, like a clock. It cannot run backwards. You can't say we're going to have a business that makes a lot of money, and when we do that, we're going to treat our people well and provide them good benefits and so forth. No, it has to be the other direction. Right? You have to do all the things that create value, and then you harvest that value, and then you again keep that cycle going. It's especially important to think about society and business and the planet, the relationship between them in a different way. You know, for many years, we've had this corporate social responsibility movement, right? And we've also had a sustainability movement focused on the environment. So it's really about looking at the world in this way, that here's the business, here's the planet, here's society. So I was at a conference at Net Impact, and the head of McDonald's, CSR, was saying, my job is over here, and we have a director of sustainability whose job is over there. And meanwhile, the business, everybody else can keep doing what they're doing, because we're taking care of the social and the environmental piece. And I said, well, isn't it true that there's our planet and there's human society and there's your business? And isn't the overlap 100%? Everything you do is done within the context of society and it's all happening on this planet, so shouldn't every decision be looked at that way? And that's a much different way to think about CSR and sustainability, right? that it is central to everything that we do. Okay, leadership. Now, again, if you leave India, one of the requirements is that you have to use a Gandhi slide. Okay, in every presentation. So whether Gandhi said this or not, I'm not sure. It's one of those things. But we must be the change we see in the world. You cannot have a conscious business without a conscious leader. You know, we get CEOs sometimes look at the financial performance that I will show you and say, okay, we want to do this. I say, no, don't do this because it's simply going to be a way to make more money. If you do it, it won't work. Do it for the right reasons. We have to do the right things for the right reasons, which means you have to embody consciousness as a human being, which will then show up in your capacity as a leader, which will then show up in the business. So conscious leadership we have identified, first of all, the acronym is selfless. Conscious leaders are fundamentally not about themselves. They're not about their ego, they're not about their power, they're not about their financial enrichment. They are really about service. Service to people, service to the purpose, service to the planet, enabling society as a whole to flourish and enabling people to be fulfilled, being good stewards of the lives that they touch. 
and then of course these are some of the qualities which I won't go into in any great detail, but I want to highlight these. You know, we tend to hire and promote CEOs on the basis of intelligence, right, and their ability to deliver numbers. There was a study published in the Harvard Business Review that showed the emotional intelligence within a company is lowest at the CEO level, and then it goes up as you go down the hierarchy. We need it to be the other way around. The highest level of emotional intelligence needs to be with our leaders, along with systems intelligence, being able to see the whole, and spiritual intelligence, being able to understand meaning and purpose, and how that drives not only them, but all the people in the organization. So we have to appoint leaders who reflect these qualities, and many of these can also be developed and grown, like IQ, which really cannot be changed. All of these other things actually can be evolved. Simon Sinek has a new book out called Leaders Eat Last, which I think captures this idea. Leaders Eat Last, where does that come from? It comes from the US military, where there's a tradition that you line up in reverse order of seniority it's time to eat. You have to take care of the, the people first before the leaders, the generals and others take care of themselves. So as he said, in the military, we give medals to those who are willing to sacrifice themselves so others may gain. And in business, we give bonuses to those who are willing to sacrifice others so they may gain. When you have a large layoff and the stock price goes up, you know, everybody with stock options benefits greatly. And people do get bonuses for doing those kinds of things. What about the impact on the lives of all those people? We're too cavalier about those kinds of things. A leader who is fundamentally about using people to achieve their goals and their personal ambitions and their own success is not a leader. That is the definition of a tyrant. That is not a leader. A leader fundamentally has to be there to take you to a better place. It is an awesome responsibility to be a leader. It is not a title. It's not a privilege. It's not a rank. Culture. As usual, Peter Drucker said it very well, culture eats strategy for lunch. You've probably heard this phrase now. A lot of people are uh, discovering this phrase. Your strategy, I mean, everybody knows the strategy of Southwest Airlines, okay, it's no secret, but you can't copy it because the culture is what's unique. Culture cannot be copied. We actually think it doesn't wait until lunch. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Extremely, so paying attention to culture and creating the right kind of culture is critical. And the attribute, the acronym there is tactile. If you walk into a Whole Foods or a container store or a Patagonia or Southwest Airlines or a Costco, you will feel positive and you'll feel that people are happy there. People, you know, like to be there. They like to take care of their customers, right? They are engaged, they're passionate, they're committed. So it's it's very tactile feeling. But it also stands for these attributes. And I'm gonna focus for a few minutes on this idea of caring, because this is a significant difference. This was a question that was asked by the founders of Whole Foods when they started in 1978. It said, can we build this business on love and respect? It seemed kind of a radical idea at the time. It still is in many ways. Because I said, we look around and most businesses that we see actually seem to operate a great deal of fear and stress. Right? Do people look forward to going to work on Monday? What happens? Why do we have this phenomenon in the US and now Really, in many places, the idea of, thank God, it's Friday, right? It's a very successful restaurant chain. Thank God, it's Friday. When I first came to the U.S., I sort of got it by asking my American friends, Joe and me, I said, I thought you go to church on Sunday. You know, what's all this about thanking God on Friday? They said, don't you get it? We survived another hellish week at work. So now we get to celebrate, we get to party, which means we get drunk on Friday, and then we do it again on Saturday. Sunday rolls around, and then what? Right? Sunday comes. Then, here we go again, right? So there was a uh, statistic I heard first from the Dalai Lama. I was at a conference in Seattle, and he said, heart attacks are highest on Monday morning. Do you believe that? You can look it up. 20% increase in heart attacks, starting late Sunday night into Monday morning. Think about that. Our work is literally killing us. Right? We are living in the most peaceful time in human history, you know, there's a wonderful book by Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature. There are fewer people being killed in wars by murderers, terrorists, etc. There's less violence in homes, less violence in schools, but our work is what's killing us. It's causing not only heart attacks, but all kinds of other stress-related health impacts. And does it have to be that way? If you look at the data on employee engagement, it's really very, very shocking. You may have seen the Gallup data. For the U.S., only 30% of U.S. can be described as engaged in their work. About 50% are indifferent, 
and 20% are actually hostile. It's like you've got a boat with 10 people rowing, but really only three are rowing, and five are pretending to row, they're just skimming the surface, and two are hitting other people over the head, their paddles. That's the typical business in the U.S. And by the way, on a worldwide basis, only 13% are engaged, according to Gallup. So the U.S. is actually better than most. This is an extraordinarily shocking statistic, if you think about it. Look at the waste of human potential, not only in terms of financial impact, but think about all those wasted lives. Do you think people don't want to make a difference in the world? Don't you think they, they get up and say, I'm going to have another terrible day where I don't add value for anybody and I'm going to be miserable? Do people want that? No, people want meaning and purpose. They want to make a difference. Is it the fault of the people? I think the people are okay. It's the leadership that's lacking. If you take the exact same organization, replace all the people, the same statistics will show up. It's the system, it's the culture, it's the leadership. We have to change that. Because if you only have this level of engagement, we're not going to get, as I said earlier, inspiration and, and, and creativity and all the rest. Now, as Freud said, love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. These are the two things that define what it means to be a human. Adam Smith wrote a book on work or on self-interest, right, Wealth of Nations, but he wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was about the human need to care. That came 17 years before. Now, if we had combined those two in the world of business, that it doesn't just have to be about self-interest, it can also be about care. I believe the history of the world would have been quite different the last 200 years. There would not have been a Marxist revolution. There would not have been the need for militant trade unions if we had recognized that caring is not incompatible with work or with business or with being a leader. In fact, it is at the core of what that should be about. So we need to combine these two, and that's really what the essence of our movement and what my research has been about the last 10 years. You know, I looked at a number of companies as I said, it started as a steady call in search of marketing excellence, looking for companies that spend very little on marketing but had outstanding loyalty and trust. And eventually we discovered that these companies were loved not only by customers but by all their stakeholders. So then we started identifying companies that indeed were loved by all stakeholders. And people were using these kinds of words. So that book was called Funds of Endearment, came out in 2007. And that really revealed a way of being that we talked about earlier, purpose, stakeholders, etc. Right? That was very different from the traditional way. And we just did an update of that book. Uh, second edition came out uh, last year. And now we have a larger number of companies. We had a lot more data this time that we could use on stakeholders to select these companies. We have, what, 72 companies overall, 29 U.S. public, 28 private, 14 non-U.S. The interesting thing is the financial performance of these companies. We measured it after the fact. We did not pick any of these companies based on their financial results. We said, do they meet all these criteria? And now let's see how do they do financially. And our hypotheses were quite modest because we said they're paying the people well, they're providing great benefits, they're paying taxes at a higher rate, they're paying their suppliers more, investing in communities, investing in the environment, treating their customers well. Maybe there's a little less left over for investors. And maybe that's okay if you think about all the value that they're creating for other stakeholders. And what we actually found was that they outperformed dramatically in the long term. It was 9 to 1 in the original book over 10 years, and this one is 14 to 1 over 15 years, way above the S&P 500, and even above the companies that were cited in this book, Good to Great. Good to Great is one of the most significant business books of the last 20 years or so, certainly in terms of sales, and I see it on the shelf of every CEO. But Good to Great actually went about it the other way. They looked at high-performing companies that had gone from being average to outperforming the market 3 to 1 over 14 years, and then said, okay, what did they do that changed them? And they talk about level five leadership and big, hairy, audacious goals and, and hedgehog principle and all of that. Good, the, the principles were good, but the fundamental lens with which they looked at those companies was purely financial. They said the only thing that matters really ultimately is making money. And with that lens, only 11 companies made it into good to great out of our last 100 years of companies. And that list included Circuit City, which is now gone, Fannie Mae, Walgreens, which is an okay drug retailer, but nothing special about it, and Philip Morris, the world's largest tobacco company at the time, was cited as a great company of the last 100 years because they made quite a bit of money. What about the impact that they had on the lives of people? Six million people will die this year from tobacco. One billion will die this century. We spend $600 billion a year on health consequences worldwide from tobacco, and life expectancy goes down 15 years. Those are all important. Don't they matter? Don't you think it matters? 
what impact we have on people's lives as to whether you would call that a great business or not. And by the way, those companies have not continued to perform financially either. They were selected for financials and they have not been able to sustain that. Why? Because they are not in touch with the fundamental drivers of value creation, which have to do with the impact on people. So, you know, making money is Profits are a social good. It is socially irresponsible to be not profitable because then you are a drain on society. You're not really creating a value. We need that for all the other things we need in society, right? To create a safety net, invest in infrastructure. All of that ultimately starts by somebody making a profit somewhere. Profits are essential, but it matters greatly how you make the money if you're in business. If you make it by squeezing employees and, and damaging their lives or damaging the lives of your customers and externalizing costs onto society and polluting the environment, and squeezing your suppliers, and evading taxes, et cetera, et cetera, and you've delivered all these bounty to your shareholders, I'm sorry, that's not worth anything. That's a parasite, that's not a business. A business is one that recognizes the potential for value creation for all stakeholders. The fact is businesses create, but they can also destroy value. And not just financial, it is also intellectual capital. All the innovations and breakthroughs. It is the impact on social capital, trust in society. It's the impact on emotional capital, living with love and care instead of fear and stress. Spiritual well-being, having meaning and purpose in your life through your work, which is where most of us get it. Impact on the culture. What is the spending of $1 trillion a year on marketing in the U.S.? What's it doing to the popular culture? What's it doing to the body image of young women? What's it doing to eating disorders? There's a lot of data on that. It is having a corrosive impact on the culture because we are doing it in an unconscious way impact on our bodies and the impact on our environment. So all of these are the consequences of our actions as a business. A conscious business seeks to have a positive impact in all these areas for all their stakeholders. And a traditional business says, well, I'm just about making money. Everything else is a side effect. I'm sorry, there's no such thing on this planet as a side effect. You do things, they have effects. Just because you put it in fine print doesn't make it less important. So all of the consequences do matter, and you can do it in a way that you have positive effects across the board. I don't know if you can read that. This kind of shows the complacency that we have had, right, where many people in this world are doing well, and many, you know, million of others are really struggling to get by, right? The fact is that we have to recognize that we are actually all in the same boat. We're all connected. Our fates are intertwined. Problems that we think exist over there, actually there is no there, there. It's all one system. This planet is one system. Humanity is one spirit. There is no other. And we have to start recognizing that and acting that way. So we need to live and lead by these ideas that humanity is one spirit. We know that our natural resources are finite, but really ultimately what is going to be our redemption is the fact that our inner resources as human beings are really infinite. One unlimited resource on this planet is human ingenuity, human caring, human creativity. I do some work with this Korean steel company called POSCO, and it says at the entrance, resources are limited, creativity is unlimited. And that's really a substitute. We have to liberate human creativity, and for that we have to start thinking about people in a different way. We use this term human resources. Most of our companies probably use that term still, right? Think about it. Human beings are not a resource. A resource is like a lump of coal. What happens when you use a resource? Does it come back tomorrow a better resource, or is it used up? It's burnt out, right? Resources do get depleted. And in, in many settings, that happens to human beings. We burn out as well. But in the right setting, human beings are not a resource. Human beings are a source. And the source is like the sun that continuously generates light and warmth and energy. So human beings caring and compassion and creativity, these are all infinite capacities that we have. The most powerful form of renewable energy on this planet is a turned on human being, right, where we've been able to liberate all the extraordinary power. Remember, when we were able to uh, break an, an atom and recognize and release the power that's inside a single atom, imagine how much force and potential there is inside human beings. But most people are never able to access that or tap into that. So I'll leave you with this thought that those of us who are alive today have the opportunity to lead the most meaningful lives that human beings on this planet have ever led. Just think about it. Our challenges are greater than ever. There are nine, seven billion of us heading to nine. We have significant crises and challenges on every front that we look. 
but so is our consciousness of those and so is our capacity to do something about it. But what we have to do is to liberate human capacities to be able to deal with those challenges. And we do that best, I believe, in the context of business, not governments and not other institutions. Businesses are going to solve these challenges, but not a business that is run in a traditional way based purely on profit and on using people and treating them as objects, but businesses built upon a higher purpose that built upon love and care, led by people who truly want to enable each of, a, each of their people to flourish. When you do that, you create extraordinary power, and business will be the solution that moves us forward as a species. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure how I did on time. Thank you. And I believe we have some time for questions. Questions or comments? How do you change the mindset of your employees towards conscious capitalism? The mindset of employees? Well, first of all, it has to start with the leader. If the leader truly and authentically believes this and is committed to it, and then they start showing it through their actions and their words, and they communicate relentlessly and they listen to people, what you will find all over the world, I've seen this, people are hungry for this. There are no employees anywhere in the world that I have found that don't want this. Why wouldn't you want this? Why wouldn't you want work that has meaning and purpose that you're excited to go and be part of something great, where you're treated with respect and dignity and caring? where there's transparency and trust. I mean, why not? But the problem is that people have become cynical and they've become distrustful because they've been burnt in the past. They've been disappointed. You know, they say a cynic is a disappointed idealist. And many people have become cynical because they've been disappointed time and again. So it really, as I said, has to start with an authentic commitment and personification of these ideas by the leader. And if you do that, I can promise you, this is like feeding candy to a kid, okay? People want this. You may have to deal with middle management a little bit because middle management tends to be invested in the status quo a little more. But I would say rank and file people, they definitely respond extremely positively. And we've got many examples of companies that have done that. Here. Is uh, the country of Bhutan an example of what you are telling us today? So you're talking about Bhutan, right? The country of Bhutan, is that what you said? Yeah. The country of Bhutan, is, yeah. can it be an example of what you are telling us today? Well, Bhutan does something called gross national happiness, right? Um, so again, at a government level, maybe there's some things there that, that one can learn from, but I think they, I, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert, I haven't been there, I haven't seen it with my own eyes. I've read things positive and negative about it, other people in the room might know more. Um, so, Again, it's not being done in the context of business. I don't think they're harnessing free markets and free people. It's really a top-down approach by a government, I think. Right? So this is much more about liberating people to operate in this way, and then doing it with consciousness will then enable much more flourishing to happen. So, Sorry, I can't give you a more concrete answer about Bhutan. Dan has said. So Raj, thank you, very interesting. And I was using your um, uh, reminder that we have incredible amounts of information at our fingertips to Google some of the facts and yeah. people that you were talking about. And I, I ran across a New York Times article um, which reported about the 1,100 blog posts under the name Rahodeb that John Mackey surreptitiously posted. Uh, to boost the stock price of Whole Foods and to disparage his competitors. And I want to know how that's consistent with some of the other values. Okay. Uh, there's, we actually have written about that in the book. There's a whole section. John has been very candid on that. Um, so this goes back a number of years, and John was posting on some uh, investment websites, along with thousands of other people, each of whom had a screen name. Right? Nobody posts under there. And... About two years before they acquired a company called Wild Oats, he had said some things about Wild Oats in terms of their strategy, et cetera, that he didn't agree with. And he may have said some positive things about Oats. So these are about three or four postings out of a thousand. And the last was two years before they decided to acquire the company. An investigation was made by the government that this one anonymous poster, who nobody knew it was the CEO, 
that his postings, three out of a thousand, two years earlier, would have the impact of pressing the stock for one company and elevating another, and therefore two years later he was from that. That was dismissed. It cost them $40 million to defend that lawsuit. I think it was an example of the government heavy-handedness. They came in, they took all the computers, they went through all of his personal emails, etc. I mean, this is shocking that in the U.S., a private citizen can be subject to that. And ultimately, it was found baseless. The government had unlimited resources to throw against that. Whole Foods had to spend $40 million to defend, and ultimately were found innocent of all wrongdoing. And yet, of course, that taint kind of remains, right? And yes, so John has said, now, I'm not going to be doing that anymore. But it was, I think, disproportionately blown up. And it's easy to point to that. If you don't want to believe this stuff, it's easy to find any one little thing and say, okay, that invalidates the whole thing. I don't think that's a fair way to look at it. Because you have to you know, look at the whole story in perspective, I believe. So I'm happy to talk about it more. But as I said, John has written a, thousands of words on the blog explaining it, as well as it's in the book as well. I think we're getting the time up sign. Is that it? Yes? Okay, again, thank you all very much.